One guest that we featured last week provided confidence for Alabama fans, and that was Chris Landry. He's been telling us that for three or four weeks, that he, he liked Alabama in a preparation, giving Nick Saban this much time to prepare. And uh, Chris Landry, he nailed it. And uh, Chris, for that, we give you a big salute here, man. You were all over. We had nobody else tell us uh, from what you told us on the national level, we had nobody else that picked Alabama to beat Clemson. Uh, you did it for five weeks here on this program. Thank you again for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Happy New Year to you and all your, your fine listeners. I cannot wait to dive into this Alabama Clemson. I've been looking forward to this segment, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I just want to hear your thoughts. What happened? What went wrong for Clemson? What went right for, right for Alabama? Well, the, the, the difficulty for Clemson in a game like this is how are you going to get Alabama's defense moved? Um, Alabama defensively were getting healthy, or and tough news today, by the way, uh, getting uh, another injury, you know, loss. But but they've we know they've gotten healthier. So how are you going to run the football on Alabama? It's always a challenge. So how are you going to make enough plays in the passing game? Um, this is not the same type of quarterback as that Alabama faced the last two years. So my feeling was it was going to be very difficult for Clemson to do so to make enough plays in the passing game. And if you're one dimensional. Um, if you're, you're effective in a two-dimensional offense, you're going to have a hard time against an Alabama's defense. If you can't throw the football, you're going to have an even more difficult time. Um, I thought that, that Clemson's defense would have some success, and at points in time, they did against Alabama. But the difference was Alabama was able to stay on the field just a little bit more. They were more opportunistic on defense, so they... Look at the field position. Alabama controlled this game from a field position standpoint. Didn't have as far to go. We're able to get enough points and defensively score some points and set up the offense for some points. It wasn't what you'd call a great offensive effort by Alabama. It was functional enough, controlling enough, to where it forced Clemson's defense to struggle some a little bit, to bend a little bit, and that was just enough. For Alabama to take advantage, and Alabama gave Clemson nothing on offense. So one-dimensional offense um, that Clemson had, and you give Nick Saban time to prepare, and you give him the ammunition of being able to, whether accurately or not, sell to his team that nobody thinks you can do it. You haven't been dominant for a while. Let's look at this. You struggled against Mississippi State. You struggled against Auburn. You don't look the same. People don't think you're dominant anymore. We'll see whether you can be or not. I don't know. That's the type of challenge for three and four weeks. I've just been around the guy enough to know that he can sell that as good as anybody. And he had a bunch of talented kids, a lot of them that came back healthy, that were able to contribute, being sold on the fact that, you know, you, you they wanted to take it out on a lot of people. So that, to me, was a big factor and one of the reasons why I thought they could have few of the reasons why I thought they would have success against Clemson. Yeah, we're talking to Chris Landry. LandryFootball.com is the website. We're breaking it down with him. Everybody here in Tuscaloosa is a little disappointed overall with the offensive performance as far as maybe. Right. But did they not, once they saw that Clemson wasn't going to score on their defense, did they not sort of go back in a shell a little bit and maybe even keep some of the things that had worked throughout this next, uh, you know, the last four or five weeks in preparation, knowing that, Hey, you know what? This team's not going to score a touchdown on us. I, I think the way you phrase it, um, I mean, it, it's it's maybe a good way to phrase it. I, I would say this: that their offense has been, and to some degree, will always be somewhat risk averse. If you're built around a defense in a running game, they do not want to put the game, Alabama does, in the hands of the quarterback. Quarterback throw the football more, and I know people have said, well, Tua could throw it. It could do this and that. Yeah, you can throw it. And if you throw it and you turn the football over and you give Clemson a short field, and now you've taken the strength of your team and now you got a game. And now they've got some points. Because this game was pretty close. I mean, it was a, a one-possession game until it wasn't, until it, it kind of started to gradually just – there was always a chance that one big play could put Clemson back in until Alabama just started to kind of squeeze the life out of them. That's how Alabama's approach is. It's we're going to dominate at the line of scrimmage. We're going to be physical. And when they don't do that, folks, when they have injuries or otherwise and they can't dominate, then, then they're, that's when they're vulnerable and that's when they can lose. 
you know, it's hard to explain to the folks, Ryan, that, you know, people want to be, they want to be spread and score 40 points a game and then be a team that can shut people out and hold them to three. It doesn't work that way. It's one or the other because how you play offense affects how you play defense. In other words, if Alabama would open up their offense, they wouldn't be a great defense because they'd be on the field a whole bunch, and they would give up points. Even though they're the same talented guys, they'd be running, they'd be on the field all the time, it, it, it would be a completely different pace. I think probably what most Alabama fans would like to see is not a change in the offense, but more functionality in the passing game. And that, okay, the ability to throw it and make some big plays, but that is something that they're going to have to do maybe against Georgia, and they're going to have to be more successful potentially against Georgia than they did against Clemson. But there is something to the effect that when you've got game control, you don't make mistakes. And that's kind of why he gets he gets the, you know, the red you-know-what when things kind of – you're leading – but you make a mistake, you run a bad play, you execute it wrong, and you just give them one more chance, you don't ever want to do that because there's always a play, there's always a mistake, something that can happen, and unless you're blowing people out, you're, you're going to have a hard time to overcome it. So I think that it is fair for fans to say, man, I worry about the passing game. You know, I wonder if we got to throw it, can we win? And the answer to that is, is unknown. They may not be able to. But what I know is they're gonna, they know their best way of winning is controlling the game defensively, finding a way to throw the football well enough, the short passing game, the RPOs, the run elements with Jalen Hurts. <clears throat> Excuse me. If, Clem, if uh, Georgia wants to play more man coverage like they had to do against Oklahoma in the second half, Alabama will look and see. They're going to run Jalen Hurts like a running back. They're going to do a lot of different designs. They're going to try to do things to get them moved, and then maybe they have no aversion to throwing it. They just want to throw it safely to make big plays while minimizing the negative plays. Well, if you're going to be a pass team, a pass-heavy team, even a 50-50 pass team, then you're going to have more mistakes and you're going to have to live with it. And I say that most people are just happy with winning and uh, I don't think anybody in Alabama wants to see um, 44 uh, to 42 games and you go 8-4. and four. You know what I mean? And I'm not saying that you have to do that. You want to see a really good football team that's really good on offense, but maybe just slightly short of national championship caliber, you saw it in the Rose Bowl with Oklahoma. That's what Oklahoma – and I'm not saying Oklahoma couldn't have won it, but again – that's like a basketball team that has to have a hot shooting night every night because, in the end, they can't stop people. And so the defense is the constant. The defense travels well. The defense is not as much scheme-oriented. It's adjusting. It's being in position. And if you've got the best talent and you're well-coached over the course of a season and an off season, you're best able to handle that. And you minimize, you marginalize considerably the risk – of the big plays in the passing game, which could be big for you, big for the opponent. But I, with all that said, absolutely, you know, you, you, you ideally like to see more big plays and in the passing game. And, you know, I know as, as, as fans, you'd like to see them score 35 points and hold an opponent to 10. Uh, I don't think this team's built that way. I, I think that to score a lot of points, they're going to have to do it running it. And I don't think they're going to be able to run up and down the field on Georgia. I think they're going to have to do it in a similar way and are going to have to put pressure on the quarterback. They're going to face a better passer this week, or you know, the championship game Monday, as opposed to a less of an athlete. Uh, so there's going to be a difference there. And I want to continue talking about it. Chris Landry right now with us, LandryFootball.com. Chris, how frustrating is it coaching against Nick Saban? Well, I think uh, – I've- I've never had to do it. Um, we've worked together, and I've, you know, I've been in the NFL for so long that um, I, I've never coached against them. I, I think that here's the thing that's a little different about Nick, um, and I think it's the same about Belichick. And quite frankly, I think Kirby has this this quality. I think 
a, a few things that are that are that are similar. They have the attention to detail and the attention to focus to always try to win the play and forget about the last play or the next play, just just the one that's in front of you. So that focus there is really good through everything. Everything you do, off-season program practice, spring practice, what have you. That's the first thing. And, and most people are the opposite. Most people just sit there and they want to get things done, but the results don't happen. You have to make them happen. Two, I think the ability to see and adjust is exceptional for those type of guys. And so his ability to see things and be able to stay on top of it's always very difficult. Uh, when he has time to prepare, he's got better players, and he's coached them better over time. People say, well, Nick wins because he gets the best players. Um, he gets the best players, and he teaches them the best. It's not like he out-schemes you with a lot of you know, icing and glitter. It's he wins on how he prepares week to week, all year long, and that's tough to beat. You go into a game and you try to figure out how you're going to beat them. You got to stop their run. You got to find a way offensively to spread them out. Do you have a quarterback that can do it? And then, oh by the way, if you do that again, can you stop the run without having to put you know eight nine players in the box? It, it's just difficult. He is going to have a plan, and he's going to be able to attack it. It's very difficult to prepare for guys like that that leave no stone unturned. They have a plan. They have an idea for every circumstance. He's not. He, the teams usually don't make mistakes. And normally when you are in championship-level football, if you look at it, it's about the plays you don't make, not the plays you do make. Now, in the NFL – it's really about that. If you want to look at why the Patriots consistently win, look at the plays they don't make, not the plays they do make. And oftentimes people say, we should have beat the Patriots. We could have done this. And we... Yes, but they didn't make the mistake in the red zone. They didn't uh, make a personnel uh, 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 mistake in the red zone defensively. They didn't call a play. that it, it, they, they do a better job of avoiding that. Now, in college, in most games that you play, and if you're a place at, like Alabama, you're going to win just because you're better. But he uses opportunities in games in which he overwhelms teams to get his team to play to a standard so that he's preparing you when they're playing Mercer or whomever that when you play in a conference championship, an SEC, you know, a national championship, a playoffs, this is what you're going to have to be focused on. So you have to defend this route this way all the time. Not sometimes, not most of the time, not when the game is on the line, but all the time when you're up by 40. Because if you don't do it a certain way, then you're more apt to mess up when you have to have it. You want to make it routine. It's like you don't think about tying your shoe. You just do it. You know how to do it. He wants to make it so muscle memory focused that he has them prepared for every situation. And that's what makes it difficult. Try to beat that when they got the most talent and they're the best prepared, they're the most disciplined, they're the most hungry. Well, good luck. I mean, you know, you got to have something unusual happen. you got to make a few plays. Your ball's got to bounce a certain way. And you got to get them on an off day, quite frankly. You really do. They have to help you. The problem is they don't help you a whole lot. But you, you look at Nick Saban. Certainly, listen, A.J. McCarron was a – uh, stud at quarterback, right? I, mm -hmm. I think he'll be a, a guy that will have a chance this offseason to, to earn a starting job in the NFL. But you go through his list, like he doesn't need, you know, as I go through the last champions, he doesn't need a, a, a Cam Newton. He doesn't need a, a Jameis Winston. He doesn't need a Deshaun Watson. He can kind of get it done without, you know, that A plus 10 out of 10 quarterbacks. Does that make any sense? Ryan, I'll take it a step further. He wants that type of guy because here's what happens. It's not that you don't want Deshaun Watson or somebody like that, but you're putting the ball in the hands of a Deshaun Watson, which is great, but you're, it's all about the quarterback. The quarterback gets hurt. quarterback has a bad day. What happens? You lose? Now, I know Clemson won the national title, but the reason is Nick Saban would love to have a Deshaun Watson. If Deshaun Watson will play the game, like uh, an A.J. McCarron, or, or someone that is not going to force the football in the harm's way. 
So in essence, what he wants is the quarterback first and foremost to be a good decision maker. Protect the football. That's the most important thing. So eat it. Don't take a sack. Don't throw a pick. Don't fumble the football. That's what he wants. And if you can do that, and and if you, if you can't do that, you're not playing for him. If you can do that and you have the ability to make plays, that's great. That is gravy on top of you know the, the the meal. It's just that he doesn't want to be a a team. The only way for him to lose some games is if he has a quarterback that's risky with the ball and you turn it over. Because you can be the better team. You lose the turnover margin by three, you're going to lose the game to a team that's inferior to you. And he's not going to do that. He's not going to put the ball in the hands of a quarterback. He's going to put it in the hands of his entire team in his entire process. And that's why he's consistently able to do it. And he's able to do it with different quarterbacks. And there's no doubt A.J. can throw the football better. And he can do more things than Jalen Hurts will ever be able to do. Um, but Jalen Hurts can do things running the football that A.J. couldn't do, or McElroy or any of the guys. So there's a difference there. And he can he can go about doing it a different way, and it's quite frankly why he, dra- he drafted, why he recruited Jalen Hurts, because he had more of the run-pass option. He can do more things athletically. And with Tua, if, if, you know, he'll get time in the spring and everything. Tua's great. Everybody loves Tua. You know, I get that. And he's made plays in the spring game. He's made plays in mop-up duty. Folks, that's not making a play on third down, and you got to protect the football. You don't want him throwing the football and putting it in harm's way in a spot where he's just a, just a smidge behind. You know, all of a sudden it's a pick, and it's a big play. I mean, you saw what happened against Auburn with Jalen. What happened? Turnovers, mistakes, miscommunication, boom, it just it snowballed into what was a disaster for Alabama. And so that's – what he wants. He wants a quarterback that's first and foremost a decision maker. And then on top of that, yeah, he wants to be able to throw it. And if a guy like Tua can be both, um, you know, who knows? He may be the future at Alabama. Uh, And the future may be next year. I don't know. But right now, you know, he knows what he wants out of the quarterback, and it's about playing winning football. And I said it last year. I thought Jalen Hurts played championship football last year. Uh, they, They didn't get it done. Um ultimately but they they were right there so I I think that's there's no doubt in my mind that's what he wants he wants a guy that's going to protect the football and if he can do that and be more effective as a passer I think that's ideally what he like Chris I'm, I'm not just saying this because you're on I've been saying this for two hours you were spot on absolutely spot on we had nobody nobody that told us Alabama had a chance from a national level last week I mean, we were picking uh, Clemson double-digit, two touchdowns. You nailed it last week. Chris, let's just get right to it. When you look at this Georgia team, what do you see in this dog team in Athens? Well, I think they're a different team than Clemson. I have a little bit more respect for their overall capabilities. Th- this team, I'm not just talking about the, the, the program, you know, but, but the fact that this is a team that's built very much in the image of the way Alabama's built. Um, the offensive line has gotten better and better. This is not a great offensive line. Um, Wynn is a really good player. Baker's a solid player. But on the right side, they've got, in Cleveland and Thomas, two guys that are young guys that are gotten better and better. Sam Pittman may have done the best job as a position coach that I've seen maybe in the country. He certainly went. Harry Hindstead of, of Notre Dame is another one. Great line coach. Just great job. They're playing a whole lot better now. Um, they've got in from a guy that's a little bit of a flatliner. You know, he, he makes plays when they need him to. They're built around the running game, and boy, do they have running backs that they can throw at you. They'll mix in some Wildcat stuff, as we saw in the Rose Bowl, on, well, what's the goal line, red zone. They mix it up in the green zone area, outside the 20, and run it in for a touchdown in overtime. You've got to be able to set the edge in the run game, um, and you've got to put pressure on the quarterback. Again, he's not going to escape to run, and throwing on the move is something he can do, but not very effectively or consistently. So what you're going to see Alabama try to do is, again, I want to make this point that is so critical. In breaking down the tape of Alabama's defense against Clemson, 
they dominated Clemson's run game while keeping split safeties. They didn't put eight guys in the box. They defended the run with seven. If they can do that again against Georgia, they'll beat Georgia. Uh, that is critical, and that's how Alabama's built, by the way. They play a lot of two-gap front, and they build a wall. They don't care about you know, getting a lot of push and a lot of sacks. They want pressures, and they want to build a wall, and they want to be impenetrable in, in, in the run game. Georgia's going to have to find a way to spread them out a little bit. I expect Alabama's going to see a lot of screens from Georgia. I think they've got to get the ball out of the hands of Fromm quickly, and I think Alabama's going to have to do a good job leveraging the screen, tackling well in space, because that's how they're going to challenge them. They need to get Alabama's defense to stay on the field for 75-plus snaps somehow, some way. So I think they'll mix the tempo up. They'll run some uh, some looks in Wildcat and whatnot and Wild Dog, whatever they call it. Um, and, and that's what they'll do offensively. Defensively, this is a very good defensive front that, again, is tough to defend, tough to run against. Uh, there's going to be some challenges that Alabama is going to face offensively against this defensive front. I would expect Georgia to adjust, and it's one thing that, they did very well. Quickly, to just give you an idea of what Georgia did defensively against Oklahoma. Oklahoma, as everyone saw, was torching Georgia, running through them, as Nick would say, like, you know what, through a tin horn. Okay, now, what Georgia did, they went into the game saying, we're going to play cover four and cover three. Their safeties really struggled with eye discipline. Oklahoma ran the football right down on them. So what did they do? They went in at halftime. With Mel Tucker and Kirby, they said, we are going, we're going in. We have to take something away. At that point, they have to be, had to be risky and try to do something. We're going to play man coverage, and we're going to attack and run a double uh, uh, A-gap blitz and work the, the, and penetrate against the run. And what they did was they read the center, and as the center turned in his protection, the linebacker popped up and the far side linebacker blitzed the gap, and they attacked the quarterback and attacked the running game before it stopped. So the ability to adjust and to play the run with numbers if they have to is going to be key. Will they have to? If they play the run with numbers, then look for Brian, Nick, to, to have a plan to be able to try to attack them in the passing game if you're playing a lot of eight-man front. So if you ask me what is the biggest key to look for as a fan, what's going to decide this game, is look at what defense is best able to defend the opposition's running game with seven. That team will win this game. The need to play eight could cost you, but it is absolutely necessary if you can't stop it with seven. So I think it's going to be an outstanding game, and I think this uh, they've got some young corners, but you know um, that uh, but they got a couple of senior corners that play pretty well. But they got some young corners that come in and nickel and dime looks that you can attack. Uh, but I think it ought to be a really good game. I think Georgia is a little bit more balanced and complete than Clemson. Um, I think it ought to be great. If you were sizing up the line of scrimmage battle, and I'm talking about Alabama's defensive line against Georgia's offensive line, who would you favor in that matchup? Uh, the defensive lines have an advantage over the offensive lines in both matchups. I'll simplify that. Okay. I think Georgia's defensive line has an edge a little bit over Alabama's offensive line and Alabama's defensive line over Georgia's. The defensive lines have an edge here. It's not, that part is very much like the game against Clemson, and that proved out too as well, that the defensive lines were a little better. You know, it's not like, you know, Alabama didn't move the line of scrimmage against Clemson like they did, for example, against Notre Dame in the championship game or most games that they play. Um, this Georgia defensive line is pretty good. Now, um, it, it, where I think you can uh, uh, try to have to try to attack them is you try to have to work the perimeter a little bit. But boy, I tell you, they, they've got some they got some really good players uh, that Georgia does on that defensive side. Uh, Mr. Smith is one heck of a football player that just pops up and make plays after plays after plays for him. Do you think Clemson had a better front than Georgia, or, or how would you rank that? No, no. Okay. Clemson had a better defensive front, um, but, you know, Alabama didn't have great success against it. You know what I mean? It wasn't like they were moving that front. Uh, they had enough success. I thought Alabama wore down Clemson's front. I think Georgia has a little bit more depth in terms of guys that they play. They play more guys on their front than Clemson does. 
So Clemson's man-for-man up front is a better defensive line, probably better, um, just as good as anybody's. But I thought that they kind of wore them down a little bit over time. But it's not like Alabama moved the line of scrimmage a great deal. I think there's a better chance that Alabama could maybe move the line of scrimmage a little bit more here. But I think the one key is, can they get outside on the edge against the speed of Georgia? That's going to be interesting. Do you th- let me ask you about the quick turnaround and, and going back to Georgia and I know the travel and all these different things. Is, is that advantage one way or the other? You've got a uh, up and coming head coach, two years in the program, obviously Nick Saban and maybe the greatest of all time. Is, is there an advantage because of the short turnaround to either coach? No, if it was a slight advantage, it's to Alabama because Georgia had to come a longer way. I mean, obviously from California to you know New Orleans, uh, back to Athens or Tuscaloosa. Um, no, I, I think that's just a little bit of an advantage. I do agree, by the way, and I don't know why. Well, I do know why because it's hard for <clears throat> the college football committee to use common sense. But if you think about it, Ryan, you should always have like a 12-day gap between these games. I mean, you know, between the – we all know that January 1st is going to be different every year, the d- different day of the week. You know, so if, if this game was on a Wednesday because that's where it fell, fell in, well, then playing the game the following Monday is great. Right. <laughs> but, but when you play on Monday and you come back, I, I don't – you know, again, it's common sense. In other words, this game – should be played, like, instead of Monday, it should be played Wednesday or Thursday. Now, I know for the media and the fans, they're ready to get it on. And, and, and it's, it's not going to be a real disadvantage either way. But it is a disadvantage for the players that have to deal with that. Remember, they're not flying home after the game like most games. So they're staying in – I don't know what Georgia did. I don't know if they took a red eye or not. I, I think they stayed. And, and So they're coming in yesterday, and they're having to deal with that. And then there, you know they have to deal with, just like we have to deal with in the Super Bowl stuff, you got family that wanted to go to the games, and can we do this and that. you got these distractions. Oh, by the way, they're trying to heal and trying to get treatment and everything. It just, it just doesn't – it's not the best thing. It doesn't give an advantage really one way or the other. It's just not the cleanest way to do it. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but anyway. All right, Chris. I, I put you on the spot a couple of weeks ago, and, and Wednesday, 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 and I – I kept asking you, do you have a lean? If if I said, Chris Landry, you got to pick this game. It, which way are you leaning right now? And I know you well, can and reserve the right to Absolutely, no. I am. Uh, I'll tell you exactly. And um, you know, I'm I'm working on the film room breakdowns of this entire game for the website. And, and I'm gonna, I, as I do, I always make a pick and all of that. And um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna change it. I think I know unless something happens you know, unusually to to a real key person or two um, that would change my mind. I don't see it. I'm leaning slightly to Alabama, uh, but, but less so, less confident than I was against the game against Clemson for two reasons. One, one I think that Georgia can do some things better than Clemson, not all things, some things. And I think you've got – there's been preparation, trust me. Kirby and Nick, Kirby's doing this. He learned this from Nick, and they have been preparing for the event of who they were going to play either way. So it's not like they're prepared, but the preparation of extra time is one thing that I really thought was in Alabama's favor. That's mitigated with the one week. Um, I thought it was an advantage for Georgia and Alabama, by the way, and that's why I picked both of them. This one, I still look at it and say, Nick Saban in a close game. I look at Georgia. It, it they made great halftime adjustments, but boy, they 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 better not have a quarter, much less a half, where they're off the mark like they were against Oklahoma, or else they're going to pay for it. And not in terms of explosive plays, because Alabama's not explosive, you know, offensively. But uh, it, Alabama will make you pay. I, I think it's really close, Ryan. But I am going to pick Alabama in a close one here. Um, and I, I hope it's as uh, half as good as uh, – well, it'll be a different style game, but I hope it's as half as good as the Rose Bowl. That was fun, wasn't it? Yeah, it was great. It was great. I mean, both those games, man, I enjoyed both of them. It really was. And, I, it was, too. And how about that? I mean, I'm sitting there, and uh, and I've got it. Of course, I've got it set up in my home office, and I've got the uh, I've got the uh, the Alabama game on, and I think people were shocked. I was tweeting out a few things. <laughs> people, I think, were shocked that they started the game. You know, I know at some point they had to start it, but with the overtime – I think people just assume that that game wasn't going to start until 
Georgia, Oklahoma was over, but uh, no, I thought I thought the the, the game was good. Uh, the Sugar Bowl was good as well, and uh, but uh, more so just with the execution and dominance, the drama certainly was not there like it was in the Rose Bowl. Talk about Landry football and how people can connect with you. Well, we started this three years ago, and look, I mean, it was a byproduct of what I do with Landry Football Operations, which is a coaching and scouting uh, firm that that services NFL teams and college programs on coaching and scouting matters. So figured, you know, what can we do for fans? So I said, well, I'm not quite sure, and the website was the idea that was born out of it. So we take you inside the film room, we break down the game. Listen, it's it's we like to say if it involves players, teams, coaches, and schemes, that's what we do. So right now we're breaking down games like this, but after this game is over, we're gonna we're gonna have um, you know reports where we're gonna break down every prospect that Alabama signed or any every other team and give a scouting report and and keep up to date on all that. If you're an NFL fan, obviously we're breaking down all the playoff games, but we're getting ready for the draft, free agency. Um, there is no off season. There's a playing season and there's a business season in which you try to prepare for the football season. And that's what we do. When we provide you the inside information, uh, stuff that's going on, as well as the film room stuff. You got Texas A&M uh, trying to lure away Dave Aranda away from LSU, and uh, that's a big story that's going on. We're going to keep you up to date on why and what's going on, whether it's going to happen or not. Um, all those things that are going to take place that uh, we try to keep everybody up to date from the inside on. 